this is what's so cool about serving God. Your best days are ahead of you. And I'll tell you why. Because your faith should be growing. And as your faith grows, your experience grows. How many understand that? Your joy grows, your peace grows, your wisdom grows. Follow Jesus with all of your heart. And you're going to see yourself progress in every area of your life. But there's some things that you'll unlock in your life. Unlock only through wisdom. And that's why the Bible says when you're going through trials, tribulations, difficulties, challenges. He didn't say complain about it. He didn't say get depressed about it. He didn't say get be discouraged about it. He says, but this he says, be, be grateful for it. Be, have joy. Why? Because what it's going to do, it's going to grow you. You're going to... God, God grows you. There's nothing that God allows you to go through that's not going to cause some growth. But he says this, if anybody lacks wisdom while you're going through a tough time, that means I don't know what to do. He says, ask me and I'll give it to you. What he's saying is there's some things you won't fix until you learn how to fix it. And I, see, and I think sometimes as Christians, we're just looking to be zapped into success, zapped into victory. And God is saying not everything's a zap. And not everything is... God doing everything, there's some things, that some will say partnership. There, you're going to learn how to succeed. You're going to learn how to have a great marriage. You're going to learn how to overcome. You're going to learn how to manage your finances. You're going to learn how to walk in victory. You're going to learn how to think. How many understand that? Learn. Stop trusting in luck. Well, I'm just not lucky. I'm just, stop that. Start gaining some skill. Because if you start gaining some skill and knowledge, the Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. That means they're perishing, they're dying, and they're ruining everything because they don't know what to do. So we're, gonna, we're, we're covering something that a lot of people don't want to talk about, especially in church. We want to talk about our finances a little bit tonight. And, and we need to start stewarding, that means managing your money. Well, see, whatever you manage well, this is what happens. You get more to manage. Whatever you neglect, you will soon lose. So don't expect for God to give you more if you're not taking care of what you got. So if you have an apartment, even you don't own the apartment, take care of that apartment like it was your own house. And there will be a day you could have your own house because you've been faithful with what you got. Clean your car. Take care of your, your lawn. Take care of your finances. So there's two sides to having an abundant life. Say with two sides. The purpose of abundance or being blessed and having overflow in your finances, in your life, in resources, the purpose is to be a blessing to others. Do you have some leftover to feed the hungry? Do you have some leftover to give? To be a left, leftover, all of us together bring the, that to the Lord, our overflow, so we can overflow Jesus into others. Someone say desire to give. That's one thing. You gotta have a heart. I really wanna give, but there's a problem. If you don't have the money, you can't give. So there's two sides to general, two, two sides of having a good life. One is having a desire to give. Second is getting to the point that you have the money to give. And you'll never have the money to give if you don't steward what you have well. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We have Kurt. He's, I mean, he's a, I mean, I just thank God. He's such a gift to the way we're outreach. He is a pro at this stuff. He's a professional when it comes to finances and helping the church get to where they need to get to. Are you guys ready to receive your next level of blessing for 2024? It's going to start right now. Let's give Kurt a Way World Outreach welcome. He's here. He's part of our family. Good evening, everybody. You guys fired up? You know, God will turn your test into your testimony. And uh, the biggest financial screw up and the biggest or the, the worst steward with his finances was me 31 years ago. But then we, we submitted to the Lord and we decided to live God's way and apply God's principles in our lives and everything changed. Everything changed. And so today we're going to cover some things that are going to help you. But you guys ready to get started with a word of prayer? Yeah. That okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the day. We are so grateful just for the opportunity to worship you in this great country, Lord. And I just thank you right now that the plans that you have for us are to give us a future, to give us a hope, not to harm us, but to prosper us, Lord. And you've given us the keys to the abundant life. You've given us the principles, and all we have to do is hear and obey, Lord. So tonight, open our hearts and open our minds to hear the message. Speak to each and every one of us individually, Lord, and let us come away 
with financial breakthrough, spiritual breakthrough, physical breakthrough, breakthrough in every area of our life tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight we call this a workshop. We're going to be, we, you got some handouts. Did everybody get their handouts as they came in? All right, so we're going to fill some blanks in. We're going to take notes. One of the things that I know, very important when we're learning something, is to be interactive. And so I'm going to ask for some feedback today, and then I'm also going to have you fill in the blanks. And your first handout is just that one right there, that God wants you to prosper. We're going to fill those blanks in. And then we're going to go to certain work, uh, work uh, sheets as well. So you guys ready? All right. Let's go to the next slide. God wants to, uh, God wants us to gain wisdom in the area of our finances. Proverbs four seven says this: the first step to becoming wise is to look for wisdom. So use everything you have to get understanding. What what is wisdom? W wisdom's the ability to make good judgments based on knowledge, understanding, and experience. So. Has anybody ever heard of the School of Hard Knocks? Okay, so the School of Hard Knocks is not what I would use to gain wisdom. Because what that means is we make mistakes, and when we make mistakes, we learn from them, but every time we make a mistake, it costs us time and it costs us money. So I, I think that a better way to do it, you know, Dave, Dr. Dave was here and he said you could learn from mistakes or mentors. See, I think that we should learn from other people's wisdom. You know, my wife and I have been married 31 years. We love each other. We're having the time of our lives. We have an a, a amazing marriage. But I want to make it to 40 and 50 and 60 years. So I want to surround myself with people who've been married that long because I don't want to think just because 31 years have gone by, I, I, we're just going to coast to the finish line. No, you're either growing or dying, you're either progressing or regressing. And so I want to hang around people that have been married for 40 and 50 years and still are dating each other and loving each other because then I can gain wisdom. Does that make sense? Super important. Proverbs 3, 13 and 14 says, God blesses everyone. Who's everyone? I love the promises in the scripture. They're whosoever, everyone, all. It's inclusive. Every one of us can benefit from this. It says, God blesses everyone who has wisdom and common sense. Wisdom is worth more than silver. It makes you much richer than gold. Here's a note, though. Wisdom is not just about knowing what's good for you, but applying that knowledge into your life. How many of you have ever heard, knowledge is power? Okay, I see a lot of hands going up. It's completely a lie. It's not true. Knowledge is not power. Uh, applied knowledge is power. The Bible says it this way. Be a hearer? No. Don't be a hearer. Be a doer. See, we got to apply what we learn. Does that make sense? This is super important because if, if we learn tonight and these notes just go in the back seat of the car and they never get applied, they don't change anything. See, we've got, we've got to take these notes home, and we've got to have meetings and discussions, and we've got to be committed to change. And, and Proverbs 21.5, one of my favorite scriptures, says, Good planning and hard work leads to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. You know what's interesting is there's people that play the lottery all the time. And when they play the lottery all the time, they've done all kinds of studies. If they took the money that they play every week on the lottery... And they just invested it over their lifetime. They're a guaranteed millionaire by retirement. But that's not exciting, man. The power balls at a billion, right? And we get all excited, but that's a hasty shortcut. We should, we should be planning. See, I looked, up good, I looked up the spiritual definition of good planning and hard work. It says, thinking deeply about our future work and plans is legitimate and wise. And that hard work is long hours dedication and a willingness to defer gratification for the sake of long-term gain. One thing that, listen, you cannot tell me I don't have time to do this. Being busy is being under Satan's joke. See, maybe, maybe if you, tonight, maybe if you delete TikTok, TikTok, 
YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and I'm talking to myself, then we will have the time necessary to turn our financial lives around. Would you guys agree? Right? I mean, and I'm a sports guy. Maybe if I just don't watch as many games and I just get more serious about the things that are that really matter. You sports fans, any any Dodger fans in here? Any any of my Raider fans in here? All right. Okay. Well, you know, I love the Raiders. I, I could blow three hours watching a Raider game, but here's here's what I learned. You could take your wallet out and or your purse and stick it on the TV and watch three hours of the Raider game. And when the game's over, check your wallet or your purse and see if there's any more money in it. All you did was burn up the three hours that you had. And the players got paid, the owners got paid, the advertisers got paid. Everybody got paid but you. And you burned the currency that you have. Dr. Dave Martin talked about that, right? The U.S. is the dollar, the J Japan's the yen, heaven is faith, and earth is time. And you just wasted it. You didn't invest it. Proverbs 23, 3 through 5 says this. A house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. The wise are mightier than the strong, and those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. Woo, amen. What a verse. See, because each one of us can grow in the area of knowledge. So, anybody ready to learn the seven keys to financial success, right? All right, you guys ready? Number one, think about money as a tool, not the goal. God desires to bless us and bless others through us. Money's just a tool he uses to bring provision and increase with the intent of producing a harvest of generosity in us. See, money can be one of three things, typically. It could be a threat... It could be a test or it could be a tool. For many years in my life, money was a threat. See, my wife and I, we got married and we got married. My, my, we both raised Christians and, you know, our money, we didn't make a lot of money. And my wife said, well, we need, we need, we're going to pay our tithes and we're going to pay ourselves, right? And I went, wait a minute. I'm pretty good at math and we don't make a lot of money and we can barely pay our bills and if we give our tithes and then we put if we give 10% to the lord and 10% to savings we're, we're there's no way we're going to be able to eat she goes yeah but we have to and i said well honey um, how about i handle the finances that was one of the worst things that could have happened to us because our finances were cursed for years because I, I would take scriptures and pervert the scripture. I'd say, oh, God loves a cheerful giver. I'm cheerful with 20 bucks this week. Not 10%, not the tithe. So, so our finances were messed up. We were, and so every time we had money and more money, it was always a threat. But then eventually I tapped out. I'm a UFC guy. I tapped out. My arm was about to break. I was choking out. I finally said, Lord, I'm just going to do thing, everything your way. And I don't want to carry this burden anymore. See, I was carrying a burden that I wasn't meant to carry. I was trying to be the provider and the, when God was the one who was supposed to be doing all that. I needed to lay my burdens at his feet because his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and I just needed to follow him. And so when we did that, all of a sudden things changed and we became tithers and that became a routine. We became very comfortable tithing. And then we come to church and they'd present a need, like the all for him offering, or a first fruit offering, or Uganda, or Pomona. And, there, and God would move on our heart, and what we started to realize is that's the test. Because we, we got the tithing down, but now God just wants to go, do I still have your heart? Is your, is your faith in me, or is your faith in the money you have in the bank? And, and all of a sudden, we'd hear a number that we should give, and I'm like, ah. And I'm telling you, for the last at least decade, and it just happened two weeks ago at an event we were at. Honey, what's God putting on your heart? Okay, let's write it down. And we do this every time, Pastor. And we slide the numbers, and I'm telling you, for the last 10 years, it's the exact number each time. 
God's moving on our heart. It was a test. And, I, and we'd be praying and seeking, and then that's a test to get to the next level because God goes, if money doesn't have a heart hold on you, if I can get it through you, I'll get it to you. I want to see if you're ready to go to the next level. Amen? And eventually we want to get to a point where money's just a tool. It has no hold on our life. It's just a resource. Does that make sense? 2 Corinthians 9.10 says, For God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Who provides the seed? God does. See, that was huge. I had to learn that God, everything we get comes from God. Every day we wake up is a blessing from God. The air in my lungs is a blessing from God. The favor at my, my career is a blessing from God. Every single thing comes from God, and all he asks us to do is to be good stewards with what he's given us. And then when we do have extra, like Pastor said, we're blessed to be a blessing. And so what's crazy to me is this guy who never gave, who never tithed, when somebody would approach me on the street, I thought they were a scammer, Today, we, we support 14 ministries outside of the way. That, now, that's, that's what God, my wife says this all the time. She goes, you're not even the same guy. And she's right. God's done a work in me, and he's created a heart of generosity that wasn't there. He moved a heart of stone, and he replaced it with a heart of flesh in that area. All right, number two, practice tithing. Bringing our tithe of 10% of all our increase is an act of worship and honoring God. When we bring our tithe to the Lord, he, what's it say? Always, always releases a blessing. He releases his supernatural abundance in our lives. See, Malachi 3.10, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. The only scripture, God says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there's not enough room to store it. This is a promise from God. Now, I want you to understand something about the tithe. First of all, 100% of what we get comes from the Lord, right or wrong. In the scripture, nowhere will you see the words, give your tithe. You're going to see, bring your tithe. And in the scripture before Malachi 3.10, it says, will a man rob God? How? By stealing the tithe. See, the tithe isn't ours. Everything we have comes from God. The tithe is his. We either bring it or we steal it. You with me? So, so now, we may not be intentionally stealing it, but the enemy's slick. Maybe, maybe our tithe is being stolen by Netflix. Maybe it's being stolen by Starbucks. Maybe it's being stolen by Larry when he shares you, sells you some shoes, right? I, I, don't, I, I asked him if I could pick on him today. He said I could. But, but the point is this. We need to put God first. It's not a matter of our money. It's a matter of our heart. Does that make sense? So if we think about money as a tool and we practice tithing, we're on our way. Number three, prioritize God first in your spending. God promises that if we put him first, he will meet, here's the word again, all of your needs. Matthew 6, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Seek first God's kingdom and what God wants, then all your other needs will be met as well. Wow. Wow. Now, we've got to do some work here. This is where we're going to pull out our budget, our monthly cash flow plan. You have a packet in here that looks like this. It's called a monthly cash flow plan. Pull this out. And we're going to go through a couple of exists, three pages. And you're going to have to do this on your time. But I'm going to give you the resources and the instruction, but then you're going to have to follow through. Right? What does pastor say? Invest nothing, get nothing. Invest a little, invest a lot, 
Well, it's the same thing here. If you study and apply yourself, you're going to get a great return. So this monthly cash flow plan, it says here at the top, yes, this budget has a lot of lines and blanks, but that's okay. We do so so that you can list practically every expense imaginable on this form to prevent you from forgetting something. Don't expect to put something on every line. Just use the ones that are relevant to your specific situation. You're going to enter your monthly take-home uh, pay in box A. And then you're going to go on and on and on. And it's just very simple instructions. So now we're going to show you what it's going to look like practically, okay? So let's say you make $3,000 a month right now. That's your take-home pay, $3,000. Now, if you look at the budget, it tells you that 10 to 15% uh, of your money should be going to charity. So when you do the math, you take 3,000 times 10%, that's $300, times 15% is 450. So you'll see on that first line, you see it animated there? 300 to 450 should be your charity. Everybody with me? Okay, then savings, it's same thing, 10 to 15%. So that's 300 to 450. Food and groceries, five to 15%. Clothing, two to 7%. So now you've got a, a, a parameter, some, a game plan to look at. Now you start looking at translating that to dollars. So now the tithe would be $300. That's 10%. Would you guys agree? Because we're not going to steal the tithe. We're going to bring the tithe. And then offerings, that's $100. Let's say that's what you've committed to. That's awesome. Then you go to your savings and you have $100 go into an emergency fund. $100 going to retirement, $100 going to college. Everybody following this so far? Okay, then food and groceries. Now, you may budget out, you know, the, the 5% on groceries, 150, then restaurants, et cetera. And then all of a sudden now, now that you got this thing all filled out, clothing, et cetera, now what you're gonna do, now that you got your budget, you're now then gonna put on the left side what actually happens. What actually happens? Did you go over budget? Did you go under budget? You can keep moving those slides. Keep going. There we go. All right. So now on the left side, that's the actual. What did you do? Did you stay within your budget? Did you go over budget? You'll notice that I put groceries was a little higher than the budget because have groceries gone up? Yeah. But guess what? We need to be aware of that so that we can make an adjustment. Would you guys agree? And then I, I put the kids, their spending went up. You know why? Because the kids always cost us a lot more. And it's school time and this and that, right? So you do that with every line, and then you get to the very end, and you add this up, and it should show 3,000 coming in and 3,000 coming out. And that means you have a zero balance. You, your budget, you're balanced. Does that make sense? Is that going to require good planning and hard work? Yes, but are we holy warriors in this church? Yes. Look at this, you crazy people. It's Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, and you're sitting here. I, I always heard the breakthrough goes to the committed. The breakthrough goes to the, the weirdos. Everybody else is at home, and we're here at church where we should be learning this stuff. Amen? All right, number four, practice good stewardship. When we're faithful stewards over the little... God will bless us with more. Luke 16, 10 says, Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You've been faithful in managing small amounts, so I'll put you in, in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. You know, one thing I want to talk about here is stop comparing. See, your job is to be a good steward with what God has given you. And so I think a lot of times we spend so much time focusing on why did this person, why did that person, and God's going, what do you have? And can you, can you be responsible and manage what I've given you? And if you can, I'll give you more. Does that make sense? I, I love the story of the, the talents. When one got five, one got two, one got one, and the guy that had five. If, if you're the two-talent person, don't look at the five talent and go, why'd they get that? You just steward your two well. And you double your two to four. And then you double your four to eight. 
and then you double your 8 to 16, and you can't control that. This one over here that got 5 may have done nothing with it. They're still at 5. But you wasted the time, the time God gave you to steward your money by looking at somebody else. Don't do that. Don't do that. Be, be a good steward with what God has given you. Amen? All right, number five, be wise and save for your future. Joseph was led by God to save through the years of abundance for the years of famine. In Genesis 41, 54, it says, The seven years of famine began just as Joseph had predicted. The famine also struck all the surrounding countries, but throughout Egypt, there was plenty of food. Has, any, have, has anybody in this room ever received excess? Uh, like, like a stimulus check, a tax return, some, an unexpected check? What do, not us in here, but what do most of the people out there do with the extra when they get it? They spend it. They spend it. Not us. We're holy warriors. We pay off debt. We save. We do all the right things, right? We give. Okay, we do all that right stuff. But those guys out there, they, they go spend that stuff. And what I want you to see is Joseph had excess, and when he put it away, not only was Egypt taken care of, but it says the surrounding countries were taken care of as well. Who lived in the surrounding countries? His family. Could it be that, that God's calling you to be the go-to person in your family? And maybe if you have excess and you're a good steward with your finances, you could be the one that takes care of your family during difficult times? I don't know about you, but I just think that it's wise to save for the future because we don't know what's going to happen, and, and we gotta, we got to be prepared. We want to build our house on the rock. Let, let's take a look at the three things that we should do. These are called three fundamental accounts every family, every one of us should have. The first is called an emergency fund, an emergency fund. Now, let me ask you, what is an emergency fund for? Emergencies is a new purse an emergency. Shoes from Larry, an emergency. Going to the Raider game, an emergency. No, an emergency is an emergency. Now, why is this important? Because when we don't have an emergency fund, which I didn't have 31 years ago, my credit card became my emergency fund. And guess what? Today... 31 years in this industry, I have never seen credit card interest rates like they are today. They are the absolute worst I have ever seen. 25 to 35%. So when we don't have an emergency fund and we have to put it on a credit card, you might as well just put handcuffs on you because you've just gone into slavery. The second account is a short-term account. That's money for short-term goals. College, retirement. Hey, I, everybody grab a pen and take this and write this down. You guys ready? This is really important. Probably the most important note on here. You ready? Christmas is December 25th this year. Now we're laughing, but how many of us get to Christmas with no finances for gifts? Christmas is the same every year. Your birthday's the same every year. Your anniversary is the same every year. See, we could be planning and preparing for that. If I need $1,200 for Christmas gifts, I could put 100 bucks a month into an envelope and have the resources for Christmas. Right or wrong? We could do that. And then lastly is called a long-term account. That's retirement. That's your 401Ks, your IRAs, your, your Roth IRAs. It's maybe your employer plan. But you should have all three. Because one's going to take care of you now, one's going to take care of you in the short term, and one's going to take care of you in the long term. I just have a question. Does anybody at some point in their life want their money to work as hard for them as they did for it? Yeah, of course. Well, since we're talking about long term, I want to talk to you about a thing called the rule of 72. The rule of 72, one of the most powerful concepts in the world, it was created by a guy named Albert Einstein. Ever heard of that guy? Pretty smart guy. What he said was, it's actually called the law of compound interest. Okay, it's right up there with the law of gravity. Meaning this, if you don't believe in gravity and you jump off the roof, you're going to believe in gravity on the way down, right or wrong. 
Okay, well, the rule of 72 is how your money compounds, and if you're not aware of this, then you, you will get taken advantage of. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, take the number 72, divide it by your interest rate, and whatever the answer is, is the amount of years it takes for your money to double one time. So help me with my math. If I put some money in the bank and I get 1%, 72 divided by 1 is what? 72. So it takes 72 years for your money to double one time at, at 1%. How many 72-year periods do you guys all got left in your life? Not enough, right? Well, 72 divided by 3 is 24. So if you've got 10,000 sitting in the bank and, and that, that money doubles every 24 years, then the 10 doubles to 20 and the 20 doubles to 40. Can you see that? Okay. Now, if you get 6%, 72 divided by 6 is 12. So your 10,000 now becomes 20,000. 40,000, 80,000, 160,000. Now let me ask you a question. The interest rate doubled, but the money grew four times bigger. Is that a little difference or a big difference? It's big. Well, it's going to get bigger. So what's 72 divided by 9? It's 8. Your money doubles every 8 years. So the same 10,000 becomes 20,000, 40,000, 80,000, 160. Three twenty six hundred and forty thousand dollars. Big difference or little difference? No, no. Come on, you guys. Are you awake? Big difference or little difference? That is huge. It's the same ten grand. It's the same forty eight years. But would you rather end up with forty thousand, one sixty, or six forty? Six forty all day, every day. If you don't know this, the Bible says people perish for a lack of knowledge. You end up on that left side and you give your bank your money and you get 40000 and the bank makes the $600,000 off your lifetime. Do you think this is important stuff? Do you think it's important to fight for every percentage point that you earn on your money? Very important. Now, by the way, the rule of 72 works for you when you invest and it works against you when you borrow. So now we're going to talk about debt. You guys keeping up with me? I'm try, we're, we're trying to boil down a whole financial seminar in 40 minutes, okay? So, so we're, we're, I know we're fi rapid fire, but I know you can handle it, right? Right? You got this, right? When you're weak, he's strong. He, you got it. All right, here we go. P number six, pay off debt and avoid new debt. See, I don't know about you guys, but I was pretty good at the payoff debt part. It was the avoiding new debt for years that kind of got me. Do not become a slave to the lender. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is the slave to the lender. So you have another handout in here, and it's going to require just a little bit of effort. It's called a debt snowball worksheet. You can pull that out. Debt snowball worksheet. And what we're going to do is we're going to complete a debt snowball worksheet. And you're going to, as soon as you pay, oh, let's talk about those other people out there again for a second. Those other people out there, not in here, not holy warriors, when they pay off a bill, they pay off a credit card, they finally pay off a bill, they pay off a car, what do most people do as soon as they pay off that bill? They go get another one. They spend it. Not holy warriors. You know what we do? We start a debt snowball. So what we do is we, we sit down and we list our debts. So you're going to see here, we're going to list a debt. We got coals there. We got a balance of whatever, the, what is that, 320, paying two, 20 bucks a month. We got Target, 500 bucks, 20 bucks a month. We got a visa bill, 1,000 bucks, and we're paying 20 bucks a month. That's your homework. You get to list your debt. And then you budget, you look at your budget and you say, hey, I got an extra $20 a month that has nowhere to go. So I'm going to now add that to that first bill. Kohl's, they only want 20 bucks, but I'm going to pay them $40. Now let me ask you a question. If you pay more than they ask, does your debt get paid off sooner or later? Sooner. You got it. And then guess what? If we end up paying off coals all together in eight months, that thing's paid off. We got 40 bucks we could drop down to Target. 
and now we, we pay 60, and boom, eight months later, that guy's gone, and 60 goes down to the visa, and 13 months later, boom, gone. And a debt snowball starts picking up steam. Does this make sense? I'm going to give you an actual example right now. This is an actual uh, family that we helped. And I just want you to see, and the reason why this, this example is so important is they said they felt like they were drowning. They felt as though there was no hope, no future. The enemy had them. They, they love the Lord, and they're serving the Lord, but this, this was weighing on them. You guys with me? Okay, and, and you know one of the things, we talked about it last night in class, at our table last night in Holy Warriors. Somebody said, you know, there's such shame. And I said, stop it. Shame the devil. You shame the devil when you fill out the debt plan. When you put those numbers down and you start a strategy to get out of debt and live a prosperous life, you're shaming the devil. And the devil's trying to shame you to not fill it out. Stop it. Stop it. So here's, here's the numbers. Look at this. Okay, this is their debt. Those are all their bills, 24 bills. They're paying, uh, they owe $69,000. Look at the interest rates. The average interest rate's 27%. Now you keep going. Their minimum payments, they're paying over $3,500 every month to their debt. Now that column right there is very important. They will not be out of debt for 100 years. Based upon those payments, that's when they'll be out of debt, and they're going to pay $400,000 in interest. Could you understand why maybe they felt a little stressed out about their situation? But, but we as holy warriors, we don't hide. We just, you know, what does pastor tell us? If we mess up, fess up. Then get up, and then I add show up. Because if you mess up, you obviously fess up and repent. You get up. You don't stay in shame. But then you show up because every National Geographic I've ever seen is the little gazelle that's off to the side gets picked off. So, so when I mess up and fess up and get up, then I show up because I need the, 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 the pack. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we look at this, and they just started their snowball. So here we go. They, they had a car that was going to be paid off, and that was going to free up 500 bucks. So guess what? Victoria's Secret's 50 bucks. They add the 500 to Victoria's Secret. Does it get paid off sooner or later? Sooner. If they add 550 to Best Buy, sooner. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You guys get the, the idea. Now watch this. You keep going. You keep going, and you keep going. Because you're disciplined. Hard work. Good planning. 100 years, 412,000, no strategy. Debt planning, debt snowball. Two years, 11 months, gone. <laughs> debt free. $381,000 that you were going to pay to the, the banks and the credit unions that now you get to keep in your family. And you know what? I'm telling you, every single time I've seen somebody put together a debt snowball, make the commitment, Pastor, every time. It never takes two years and 11 months. You know why? God brings increase. God brings breakthrough. And that two years, 11 months is usually cut in half. Because when they're good stewards, God's up there just going, man, my son, my daughter, I love you. Thank you for putting me first. Thank you for being a good steward. I want to bless you. And unexpected blessings happen. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. You know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Don't get overwhelmed with the big picture. Just inch by inch. Number seven, set financial goals. Goal setting is getting God's success plan for our lives and writing it down. We all know Habakkuk 2.2. The Lord answered me, write this vision down, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. Super, super important. You have a sheet called a financial roadmap. And I'm going to give you a real quick overview of what your whole financial picture should look like. But at the top, there's a great question. What are some of the things that you and your family would do differently if money and time weren't an issue? Now, today's not a goal-setting exercise, 
But I'd encourage you and I would challenge you this week to pray about those things. Where would you live? What kind of car would you drive? What, what kind of hobbies? What kind of trips would you take? What kind, how, how many ministries would you support? Would you retire your mama? Isn't it crazy one mama can work three jobs and raise five kids and five kids can't ever figure out a way to take care of mama? See, we're born looking like our parents, but we die looking like our choices. We got to stop making excuses and we got to step up and go get the job done. So, so we're going to do this roadmap. So if you have goals and dreams, right? We, do we all have goals and dreams? Yes. And if we're struggling in that area, ask God for revelation to reignite those desires that he's put in your heart. And if you're down at the bottom and you want to get to the top, there's sound financial strategies to help you get there. The first thing every family in this room needs to do is protect themselves from risk. How do we protect ourselves from risk? It's called insurances. So on the far right, I want you to fill in the blanks. Uh, a is auto insurance. If you have a car, you should have auto insurance. You get into an accident. You just pay your deductible. You're not wiped out. You don't, you know, you're not financially devastated. You've got protection. Okay, the next uh, H is home insurance. If you have a home, we want to make sure it's insured, and if the house burns down, they rebuild it. The H is health insurance. And then life insurance. If I pass away, I want to make sure my loved ones are taken care of. And then wills and trusts. Those are all the fill in the blanks. Once we've got that foundation laid and we've got a solid find foundation, then we need to start saving. And that first account is that emergency fund on the left. Write three to six months in that column. Three to six months. You want to set aside three to six months of living expenses. Easier said than done, but you got to write it down and set a goal. Now, then the short-term goals, that could be vacations, cars, home improvements, and then long-term is retirement. Okay, those are all the fill-in-the-blanks. And the two biggest roadblocks that will stop you reaching your goals and dreams, the first is not enough income, and the second is too much debt. And I see the enemy behind both of those. I see he loves to entice us with debt, to get into sla to slavery. But the other thing he likes to do is keep us with broke income. God gives you the desire to start a business and you talk yourself out of it. There's a raise at your, uh, there's a promotion available at your job and you feel like you should put your resume in and, and you decide not to do it. And you just keep talking yourself out of blessings that God's preparing you for. And I remember Pastor gave this talk. It was br brilliant. If you go and apply for that job and you sit there and you don't get the job, we're not victims. What we do is we say, you know what? I know that I applied for that job and I'm really, really, really committed to bettering myself in the future. Could you just let me know what were some of the areas that I could improve so the next time I'm up for a promotion, I'll look a little more prepared the next time. And take the feedback and work on it and get better. Get a raise, get a promotion, right? It's not our age, it's not our gender, it's not our skin color, it's not our lack of degree or to, we're too educated, not educated, right? We'll talk ourselves out of God's blessing. Now, why do we do all this? Because God wants us to invest in the kingdom of heaven. See, if we're not good stewards with our finances and we don't do all the things that we just talked about very briefly, but we have a budget and we got a plan to get out of debt and we're saving money, then we probably don't have a lot of money to invest into the kingdom. God wants us to invest in the kingdom of heaven. The finances that we invest in the kingdom of heaven will never be lost because we're storing up treasures in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 says, don't store treasures here on earth where moth and rust, it, moths eat them and rust destroys them and thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. See, are we thinking too much about earthly things and not thinking about heavenly things? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. When we invest in the kingdom of God, we, we invest in the kingdom of God when we use our money to do good. First Timothy 6.18 says, tell them to use their money to do good. 
They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Always. Always. Lastly is this. God wants us to invest our finances to multiply what he has given us. Pastor talked about it earlier, about increase. See, the servants... That the servant had two bags of silver, came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I earned two more. And the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate, and I was afraid. See, pastor tells us that fear and faith cannot coexist. So out of fear and out of really actually not even knowing the master, he just hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replies, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. See, what are we doing with the talents and the tools and the resources that God has given us. You know, I love, is Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever? So does that mean when I hear in the Bible so many times Jesus say, Rob, Tiffany, what do you want me to do for you? Blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Pastor Marco, what do you want me to do for you? Those words are echoing, echoing through history, and every morning he's looking at you going, what would you like me to do for you? And if you go, I don't know, God goes, okay, I'll be back tomorrow and we'll try again. But I'd love to do something for you. And you don't have to have a lot. If you just bring me what you have, the two loaves and the five fish, I'll take care of it from there. See, it's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of the finances. Are you guys with me? All right, all right. So are we ready to do this thing? Are we ready to make a commitment to get our finances healthy? You know, Donna and I, we were at this event two weeks ago, and there was a, a, a dramatization on what's called the Bema Judgment. And um, that is a, a judgment where uh, what we've done here on earth gets evaluated and there's crowns and things like that given out and what we did on earth that had no heavenly value just gets burned up and and in that dramatization there was a gentleman who had, had who had passed away and he was 37 years old and Jesus said you know now Daniel you're 37 years old I gave you 37 years on the earth and at age 12 you accepted me as Lord and Savior and you've had my Holy Spirit for 25 years. And I gave you the gifts of teaching and the gifts of encouragement. Now, Daniel, this isn't a punitive judgment, but let's just see what you've done with what I've given you. And it all burned up. And I'm telling you, Don and I sat there and we just went, man, I know that we've been doing pretty good with our finances, but Don and I were like, man, we could do better. We, we, how can the cares of this world just get us off track? We should be focused on things above, the heaven above, and not so much here. And so I just challenge you, step out in faith in this area of finances. There's more scripture on the topic of money than any other topic in the Bible. Prayer, salvation, angels. It's, he talks about money because he knows that's where a lot of us attach our heart. He doesn't want our money. He wants our heart. Amen? We have an opportunity coming up in the All for Him offering. That's coming up. Sunday you're going to your, you're gonna get your giving envelope. But you don't have to wait till Sunday to make a commitment to say, Lord, I want to get my finances right. I just, I want to lay them at your feet. I want to follow the principles that you've laid out for me. 
that are in the book the pastor's written, that are in the Bible, that, that are some of the handouts that were given today. I want to just submit my financial life to you, Jesus. If that's you, look, why don't we stand up for a second? All of us stand up. I know right now, I don't think, I know, I've been praying over this, this me. I know there's people here that today needed to hear this. I know that today that is a day where God's stirring your heart to do, do finances His way. To be blessed, to be a blessing. If that's you, if that's you, I'm going to count to three. And what I want you to do is raise your hand. You're just tired. You're tired of the debt. You're tired of the struggle. You're tired of carrying a weight that you weren't meant to carry. We sung it earlier. Jehovah Jireh. God our provider. We weren't meant to have to carry that struggle. You want to lay your finances at Jesus' feet tonight. You want to say, Jesus, I'm going to turn the, my whole financial life over to you. And I'm going, to go, I'm going to do the things that you've called me to do with my finances. And I'm going to trust you, Jesus. One, I'm tired of the struggle. I want to prosper. But I want to prosper your way, Lord, because when I prosper your way, there's no sorrow added to it. Two, God, I'm just tired. Just tired. I don't want to carry this burden anymore. I want to trust you in my, the area of my finances. Ready? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Trust in Jesus. And, uh, amen. Amen. All over. Amen. Amen. Altar team, come forward. If you raised your hand, I'd like to uh, ask you to come down here. Give us the honor of praying with you right now. I want to pray a blessing over your finances and a blessing over you and your family. Guys, keep applauding. Give them a round of applause as they come down. They're saying they don't want to do it their way anymore. Some of these people right now, they're going to be debt free in a year. They're going to have financial breakthrough. They're going to build businesses. So excited about this next level for each and every one of you. Amen. Amen. Is there is there one one last thing before we pray? One last thing. If you heard all this today, but you don't know Jesus, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He has a plan for you. It's a good plan. It's to prosper you. It's not to harm you. It's to give you a future, to give you hope. I wouldn't, I, the, you know what the greatest Thanksgiving gift you could give yourself today is accepting Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you don't know this Jesus, and today you say, yes, Lord, I do want to put my trust in you in the area of finances, but Lord, I, I just need to put my trust in you, period. I want to know you. I want you to raise your hand because I don't want anybody to walk out of this room not knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I'll count to three. One, I want to know you as my Lord and Savior. Number two, I trust you, Lord. I'm going to allow you to lead me for the rest of my life. Three, raise your hand if you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Come on down, sir. We would love to pray with you. Pastor, would you like to pray? This is, this is what we're doing. We're overcoming a spirit of ignorance, like I didn't know. I mean, we don't talk too much about, I don't know. I don't know. It's time for us to say, I'm not going to be in the not knowing anymore. I need to know. 
And, and that's what the word of God teaches us. Success, principles, instruction for every part of our lives. Any area you want to succeed in, there's biblical application. Knowing it and doing it. Also, we're going to overcome the spirit of poverty. Okay, The spirit of poverty does this. It doesn't allow you to get money. The spirit of po poverty will stop you from getting money. You have talent, you have abilities, but somehow the money just doesn't get to you. You're always in lack. Then we're going to overcome today the spirit of mammon. The spirit of mammon will let you get money, but it won't let you give it. This is where someone has, a, they, they make a lot of money, they have a business, they, but they talk themselves out of giving. The, the devil won't let them give it because their money is their God. If you find yourself like, I got a lot of money, I don't have no poverty, but do you give? Because if you cannot give, you're under the control of a spirit called mammon. It'll let you get the money, but it will not let you give the money. And unless you could give the money, this idea, you can't give your heart. So we're going to overcome. Then we're going to pray from here on out. This is what I want you to do. Don't get overwhelmed by this. How many know this takes work? How many know that it takes work, right? It takes work to live for God. It takes work to succeed in every area. But if you hear all this and you do nothing about it, it's not going to do you any benefit. It's going to take work doing the budget, staying on budget. All these things take a lot of work. But remember we covered this earlier. Any area that you're not stewarding or managing or, or taking care of that area you'll begin to have major losses in but any area that you start stewarding, managing and taking care of you're going to start getting major gains in how many understand that? so God blesses good managers, good stewards okay now, one last thing I'm going to say work with what you got all I got is five loaves and two fish she goes, great, let's work five loaves and two fish Put them in my hands. Let's start working with that. And watch God begin to multiply. So this is, you, I don't have a lot. So if you don't have a lot, it's easier to manage. Right? I only got 500. That's good. There's somebody else has a lot more to manage. It's harder to manage that. But this is what God's saying. I'll never give you more than your ability. So learn how to handle your 500 so I can increase resources in your life and get more to you. How many of God wants to get more to you? Because if he could get more to you, he could get more through you. If he get more to you, he could get more what? So this is what he blesses you. So he produces a harvest of generosity, a harvest of giving in you. That's what it all comes down to, okay? So let's pray. Let's give our lives and let's give our hearts and let's give our finances to the Lord. Repeat after say, Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your instruction, for your teaching. Set me free from the spirit of poverty, mammon, and ignorance. I no longer want to be in that position. Set me free, Jesus. I confess you as Lord and Savior of my life. Make me whole. Set me free. I receive new life. I receive your wisdom right now. I receive eternal life. I give you my mind. I give you my body. I give you my finances. I give you everything I have. And from this day forward, I will follow you by following your commands and your instructions. Thank you, Jesus, for your prosperity, your abundance, your overflow in my life so that I can be a blessing to those that are in need. Thank you, Jesus. I receive it now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We want to get your information. If you have not, we don't have your information yet, and help you on your classes. What we cover tonight is part of Holy Warriors 3 course, and we teach you how to set goals, how to prosper in life. Go to the Holy Wars 1, 2, and 3. God bless you. We love you. Have a great, great Thanksgiving. Everyone online, God bless you. I'm so glad that you tuned in. Have a great, great, great Thanksgiving. And remember, thank God. Let everybody know that God is good. Love you guys. Enjoy your drive home and enjoy your family time tomorrow. You need prayer? Come on up here. We'd love to pray with you.